Hello, everybody. This is Scott, and this is a special edition of the Voice of the Harbinger. I uh, have not had many broadcasts this year, but we are at a point where I believe that this is uh, something about to happen that is probably of the most prophetic significance of anything in my lifetime. And uh, because of that, I'm uh, putting this broadcast out. I just did a hour and 20 minute Zoom meeting yesterday. So I'm going to condense this as much as possible to try to keep it into about a half an hour. Um, what I wanna talk about today uh, is not about the solar eclipse. Uh, that is not something that I see, find much significance in. I do not find much significance in the signs of the heavens, aside for what is spoken of in the scripture. Uh, they can be signs, I suppose, but if I were to see anything from this current solar eclipse, I would not see uh, evil omens or judgment upon America. What I would see is that as the solar eclipse is a extremely bright light that comes uh, out of the darkness uh, as the moon obscures the sun and it becomes completely uh, darkened it, when it, the sun begins to creep out we see the brightest of light uh, so bright that you have to have special glasses to be able to view it or you'll go blind and so um, this is speaks to me of, of anything uh, of just a uh, reminder to the church that Jesus is the light that's already come to the earth that Jesus has already come to live within us. He is a being of incomprehensible light and life and, and truth uh, and holiness, and he resides within us, the amazing thing. He resides within us, and if anything, the solar eclipse is saying is, let your light shine in this hour, for darkness is upon the face of the earth. But that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about something that I think is of uh, the most prophetic significance since what happened on October 7th when um, Israel was uh, attacked unprovoked and horrifically by Hamas. And um, uh, this event is coming possibly as early as this weekend, uh, maybe next month. Um, but definitely if it happens, it's going to happen in the next few months. And um, so um, if we look at, um, and I want to skip ahead, sorry, um, because there are some of the groundwork things that I shared last night that I do not want to share tonight. So uh, when the attack happened uh, on October 7th, the Lord spoke to me the next day and he said that that attack on Israel and the resulting war that was about to happen uh, was the loudest of the trumpet sounds uh, or alarms in the spirit that we've seen in our times. And that it was a sound, he said to me, of a trumpet, the blowing of the shofar, the calling to gather and unite in battle array as the glorious church. Uh, and uh, that it was possibly uh, the last of alarms, uh, last of sounds, the last of the trumpet sound, uh, the last of the blowing of the shofar that I have up there. Um, that uh, that we would have in the spirit in our lifetime as the church uh, comes to the fulfillment of tabernacles. Now, when we speak of tabernacles, one of the things that I believe is that as the church has spiritually fulfilled Passover and Pentecost, that it will also spiritually fulfill tabernacles. These are the three main feasts of Israel, and we've already spiritually fulfilled two of them. There are three parts, main uh, three main parts to uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, which is Rosh Hashanah, the, uh, also the um, Yom Kippur and uh, the Feast of Tabernacles itself in, uh, in gathering and harvest. And so um, the first being uh, Rosh Hashanah, the, 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 this blowing of trumpets, this uh, starting of the new year, this calling, uh, entering a new phase, this calling of the church to awaken and arise. So it speaks to me of this, revival that is, has been going on really in the hearts of those uh, that are pursuing Jesus, that are desiring to burn hotter for him. And, um, and so that, that, that has been taking place. There are many people all across the globe. And I'll emphasize again, we have to get our uh, vision away from nation central to global uh, because the, the church is global. It is not the American church compared to the Canadian church, the Mexican church, the Nigerian church, whatever we want to say, um, it is the global church. The church is the church and it is global. 
And the land that we are after, that we're desiring to be restored, is the earth. It is not America. It is not any nation. Um, God cares less about a nation than he does about the church. He cares about the church. Everything that God does is about the church. And um, and so anyway, this, this has blown. The shofar has gone off. And um, the next step would be for us to enter into uh, Yom Kippur. It is time for us to fulfill that, for the church to be able to walk in the glory of God, in the river of the glory of God. We have to come to a place of holiness. And as we walk in holiness, we're going to see that we are going to be entrusted uh, with that river of glory to let it flow and manifest through us like we've never seen before. Jesus is coming back, Ephesians chapter 5, for a church that is that is holy, that is blameless, that is without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. This is what he's after. And that church will be a glorious church or a church in glory, a church that is manifesting the glory of God that is within them and is manifesting the kingdom that recognizes themselves as citizens of heaven and is after that which God uh, is, is trying to accomplish in restoring of all things. And so, um, so um, let's move on. Now, the question being before us is why did Hamas attack Israel? I want to read this to you. This, is, uh, this came at the 100-day mark of the war by Abu Abiyeda, probably messed up his name. He's a military spokesman for the Hamas El Qassan Brigades. He gave a televised speech and um, regarding the Hamas efforts. And in that speech, uh, it was translated to English in the Palestine Chronicle. Here's a, an excerpt. We look back 100 days to remember the educated, the complicit, and the incapacitated among the world powers governed by the law of the jungle, reminding them, very important, of an aggression that reached its peak against our path, which is Jerusalem, and Al-Aqsa, that is the mosque that sits on the Temple Mount. Uh, so again, reminding them of an aggression, reminding the nations of an aggression. This is why this happened. To remind the world powers of an aggression that reached its peak against, our, against Jerusalem and against the Al-Aqsa Mosque with the start of its actual temporal and spatial division and the bringing of red cows as an application of a detestable religious myth designed for aggression against the feelings of an entire nation in the heart of its Arab identity and the path of its prophet, meaning Muhammad, and the ascension to heaven. So the, the uh, Islam believes that, um, that Jerusalem and the Al-Aqsa Mosque is the third most uh, holy site in Islam. Uh, it was visited by uh, Muhammad as he was brought there. Um, this um, aggression of the bringing of red cows is speaking of the red heifers uh, that are necessary for purification under the law of Moses in Numbers 19 uh, in, in the, uh, the uh, ceremony of purification and the creating of the waters of purification that were necessary to purify both the tabernacle in Moses' day, which later became the temple, and also the priesthood and the instruments, as well as uh, the purification of uh, anyone who had uh, been in a home where someone died, who had uh, found someone uh, that had been slain. So this would be relative to military conflict. It would also be relative to the attack by Hamas on the um, uh, civilians uh, that happened. Uh, and uh, also, um, uh, uh, anyone that touches a dead body was a purification for that. Um, so as we, we will look at these things in a little more detail uh, in a few moments here, but uh, this is important to understand that he is defining um, what had happened there. Now, they believe, <laughs> the, the Muslims believe that it's written in the Quran that, um, um, that Muhammad was taken by a donkey-like creature uh, in the night to Jerusalem uh, and then returned home that night um, with given a certain direction. And so that's why they consider Jerusalem to be this, this holy night, uh, this holy place. And um, continuing to read on here, he says, and as we have been informed by various sources in the resistance fronts that they are seeking to expand their strikes against the enemy in the coming days in the light of the continued aggression on Gaza, we will not tire or falter in calling all the free people of the nation to rise to support their El-Aqsa, again, the temple, or the uh, mosque on the Temple Mount, 
and the path of their prophets. So that's speaking of what I just mentioned about Muhammad, uh, which the criminal Zionists are practically advancing towards destroying, destroying Al-Aqsa Mosque and establishing their temple. This is what they believe. This is what we have chosen with our blood in Gaza for 100 days and for which the epic of October 7th was about. So it's not about anything that uh, we read in the papers about um, the mistreatment of the Palestinian people, uh, the separate place where they've been put and their feeling of being uh, uh, um, imprisoned in this small area where they have to live and all of these things that we read about in the papers, none of this uh, is true. This is the truth of why this attack happened. This is about spiritual things. And so we have to understand that. And so, um, um, so uh, just to give you a little history too, the Al-Aqsa Mosque was built in the 8th century based on that teaching in the Quran about this donkey-like creature taking Muhammad to Jerusalem. Um, and so they built that Al-Aqsa Mosque on that place as the third holiest site in, for Islam. In the 1920s, uh, there was a grand mufti in Jerusalem, and his name was Husseini. Uh, and he was the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, which later became Radical Islam. Everything that we know about Radical Islam in Hamas, Hezbollah, ISIS, etc., uh, stems, from, stems from the Muslim Brotherhood and stems from this Grand Mufti, uh, who in the 20s uh, started this whole idea of Israel is going to try to destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem and rebuild their temple, the Third Temple. And um, there was um, an attack on Tishbiav, which is the um, Jewish uh, celebration that they have annually regarding the destruction of the two previous temples. Um, and um, so he had said that they were going to do something on that day. Uh, I believe this was in 1929. And so there was an attack against Israelis who were trying to celebrate uh, that festival at the uh, Wailing Wall, and 130 of them were killed. This man continued to spread his ideas until uh, he was uh, exiled from Israel in 1937. And guess where he went? He went to Germany and uh, banded with Hitler in 1937, uh, as Hitler had already taken power and was already uh, spewing his anti-Semitism. And so this uh, was nothing more than just a support to him in his uh, radical ideas, his anti-Semitic ideas, and his desire for taking over the entire world and destroying all those that opposed him. Now, obviously, we know Islam feels that way, that there is a necessity for destruction. At least radical Islam feels that way, that there's a necess necessity for the destruction of Jews and Christians. And um, so... Uh, this, what we need to see, I'm saying all this because what we need to see is that in uh, 2017, when Hamas became more of a radical group and became a political group and took over uh, uh, in, in uh, ruling in uh, Gaza, they created a charter and their charter included all of these ideas that this Husseini from the 20s was spewing even in the 30s in Germany um, and they put that in their charter. So their idea is that this Temple Mount is going to uh, be overtaken by the Jews. Their mosque, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, is going to be destroyed on it so that a third temple can be built. And this is the whole idea of what they're after. The second thing that they speak of uh, that we don't see in this uh, excerpt uh, from the Palestine Chronicle, but is reported is that they feel that there's a desecration, a second desecration um, uh, regarding the Temple Mount besides this red heifer thing that they mentioned. And that is that um, Benjamin Netanyahu has been allowing uh, Jews to go up on the Temple Mount uh, outside of uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque and pray. Now, many rabbis are against this, um, and uh, or at least some rabbis are against this, feeling that uh, there's the possibility that by them going up there, they could be stepping in an area where the um, temple actually existed at some time. They don't know the exact location of the original temple uh, without being able to have access, which they don't have, to the Temple Mount because of the Al-Aqsa Mosque that resides there. But there are Jews that under the allowance of uh uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's decision that um, they are allowed to go up there and pray. And so they are praying. 
the concern is that if they pray or they go into an area and pray where the temple would have originally existed uh, is that they could uh, um, make it impure because they're not purified. And there cannot be access to the temple area, even though there's no walls existing of the temple, there should be no access to that area by any Jewish person until there's been a purification process. And this is what the red heifer is all about. So let's move ahead a little further to the red heifer. We find information about the red heifer in Numbers 19. It's the only place that it's mentioned. And let me read a little bit of that to you. It says this, this is the ordinance of the law, which the Lord has commanded saying, speak to the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer without blemish in which there is no defect and on which a yoke has never come. Now, I can tell you this, that um, they say that the red heifer itself is a, uh, to be without blemish means that it cannot have more than two uh, white or black hairs in it. The rest must be all red. Uh, it can never have plowed. It can never have had a tag put in its ear like we do with so many cattle here in the United States. Um, it, it cannot be lame, obviously, or anything like that. It has to be perfect in its in its function and in its in its body and in the hair. Um, it's supposedly a one in fifty thousand chance for one of those to be created. In other words, four forty nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine um, red heifers will be born, and they will all be impure. But the fifty thousandth will not be. Okay, so we move on. Uh, he goes on and he says, You shall ha give it to Eleazar the priest that he may take it outside the camp, and it shall be slaughtered before him. This place outside the camp would have been, on, uh, according to what uh, Jewish belief is, that it happened on the Mount of Olives, uh, or in that direction, that where they could see the temple entrance from the place of the slaughtering of the red heifer. Uh, let's move on. So that he may take it outside the camp and it shall be slaughter, slaughtered before him. And Eleazar the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and sprinkle some of its blood seven times directly in front of the tabernacle of meeting, which would have been later in front of the temple. Uh, then the heifer shall be burned in his sight. Its hide, its flesh, its blood, and its offal shall be burned. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast them into the midst of the fire burning the heifer, skipping ahead, says, Then a man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and store them outside the camp in a clean place. And they shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for the water of purification. It is for purifying from sin. It shall be a statute forever to the children of Israel and to the stronger who dwells among them. Uh, and then it goes into talking about this whole thing of uh, people that touch a dead body, people that um, come into contact with someone who's slain by a sword, uh, someone, if they're in a house where someone dies, purification of those people that are in the house and the vessels that have been opened in the house, et cetera. Uh, and it's all done by this water of purification, which is purified only by ashes that are sprinkled in it from the sacrifice of the red heifer and mixed with those three items that it mentioned. So, moving forward to September of 2022, um, there was a call put out in Texas uh, by two groups, uh, Bona Israel, if I said that correctly, which is a Christian organization, and the Temple Institute in Jerusalem. Now, the Temple Institute, you can find, uh, it's templeinstitute.org. I suggest that you go ahead and take a look at that site and see what they're doing. They're talking about all their preparations for... Um, sacrificing the red heifer. And so um, anyway, in uh, September of 22, in this joint effort, they put out a call to all ranchers uh, who had the possibility of producing red heifers to look for those that might be uh, ceremonially pure. And in doing that, um, when anyone found one, then they would, you know, both from this Christian ministry and also flying from Israel and the Temple Institute would come out and inspect the, the red heifers. Well, they found five and that were then shipped uh, to Israel in September of 2022 are being held in the West Bank right now, secretly uh, being taken care of in pasture there. And um, of those five, uh, they were already, I believe, a year to a year and a half old in September of 2022, which makes them about three, year olds, three years old right now. Uh, one of them has now become impure, so there's four left. And um, of those red heifers, um, um, that are now three years old, the requirement is that they be three years old. If it passes to four years old, they can no longer be sacrificed. So 
uh, this is where we are right now. We have red heifers in Israel, which is an amazing thing. What is next is being able to try to sacrifice them on the Mount of Olives. Now, there is a, a, um, a um, uh, rabbi, Yitzhak Mamo, who has purchased land next to the Mount of Olives, connecting to the Mount of Olives. He has built an altar there for the sacrifice of the red heifer. They have already done a uh, pre-run uh, to sacrificing a red heifer, and their desire is to sacrifice this red heifer uh, possibly even this weekend. This weekend is a special day. Uh, this weekend is um, Shabbat uh, Para, which is the, sh the Shabbat of the red heifer. It was something that would be the time to sacrifice the red heifer in preparation for Passover. Um, now, just to go over a few things here that are important. Uh, first of all, Jewish belief is that there have been nine red heifers sacrificed since the initial one was sacrificed by Eleazar. Um, they believe that the 10th one will usher in the Messiah. Now, of course, they don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. So this, if this is true and the 10th one ushers in the Messiah, then that would be Jesus returning, as we Christians believe, and the Jews having an opportunity to believe in Jesus and be grafted back into the vine, as we read about in Romans. Now, a couple of things that are very important for us to understand is that in order to rebuild the temple, if it does get rebuilt, you know, there are differing opinions on this. I'm of the opinion that it may not necessarily have to be rebuilt, um, but that sacrifice will need to be restored. Um, so if you're now, which means that we've pretty much got that all set up and ready to begin, at least on this altar that is adjacent to the Mount of Olives. And you can research that if you, if you just put in there, um, altar, uh, red heifer altar, uh, 2024, you'll probably find a picture of it on the internet. I've already found it. Um, if you're, uh, so if you're going to rebuild the temple, you need this purification process to happen. So in other words, you need the sacrifice of the red heifer that they're about to do. Uh, it cleanses the land. It cleanses the people, considering what they've been through with um, the dead bodies uh, through the, uh, that uh, horrific attack by Hamas, through the dead bodies that they're encountering um, in uh, their uh, eliminating of Hamas in Gaza. Uh, the 2,000 years plus of sin that has been upon the nation since whenever the last red heifer was sacrificed, all of that needs to be atoned for and purified. Um, and so all um, aspects of temple worship um, for them to take place, even if there is no rebuilding of the temple, still needs the purification of the red heifer and that, that water purification. So um, the priests have to be, have to be um, purified through the sacrifice. Uh, anybody involved in temple worship, participating in the temple worship has to be. Now, I'll tell you that the Temple Institute has also um, a priesthood. They also have children raised up in the priesthood. They've been around for, I think it is 36 years. They've been preparing for this moment for decades and are ready to, um, to move forward with this temple worship following the instructions given by God in the law so that they can do it properly. And so um, this blood that needs to be sprinkled uh, in front of the tabernacle or therefore temple on the Temple Mount, Jews now have access, allowed by Benjamin Netanyahu to pray there. If they sacrifice this red heifer, they could literally bring its blood up there and sprinkle it uh, unknowingly to, um, to the soldiers, maybe, unknowingly to the Muslims who are up there to worship in Al-Aqsa Mosque, sprinkling it before what they believe would have been the entrance uh, to, the te to the temple and purifying uh, according to the law, giving them the ability to pray freely, also dealing with all the objections of any rabbis who are concerned about prayer up on the mount and causing an impure situation. It would now be purified and it would allow for free uh, prayer on the temple mount with no objections. It would allow for continued sacrifice uh, as necessary in that spot that is been, has been bought adjacent to the temple or to the um, Mount of Olives. And so um, 
the uh, Temple Institute rabbis have said this. Uh, this is this Rabbi Mamo. He says, which means that with the help of God, we will get permission from God and from the people to make the ceremony with these three-year-old red heifers, and then we can be pure. So they are talking about doing it possibly this weekend. If they don't do it this weekend, uh, there's, their, their main desire is to do it before Passover. Passover begins on um, Friday. Uh, no, sorry, not Friday. Uh, it begins on April uh, the 22nd at sundown and ends April the 29th at sundown. And um, so we could see something drastic happen in the next three to four weeks. Um, and what would be the implication uh, of Israel sacrificing a red heifer? This is what makes this the most significant prophetic event that could potentially happen in our lifetime and happen in the next few weeks. It's huge. It's gigantic. It is, uh, it is uh, pushing us. Uh, rapidly, you know, as I've been speaking since 2021, that we're in a time of acceleration and darkness has seemed to accelerate uh, much more quickly, but the light is now accelerating. And these things, I always say this, you know, so many people I think believe that as America goes, so goes the world. I believe that can only happen in, um, in um, our economy, but because uh, all the rest of America is such a mess. And the church in America is uh, at best sleeping and at worst dead for the majority of those that are in the church in America. And so what we're talking about here is um, is just uh, something amazing because it's Israel. And I believe the truth is that as Israel goes, so goes both the church and the world. And so what we're looking at is this happening in Israel is gigantic. Can the purification of Israel through the sacrifice of the red heifer move the church from Rosh Hashanah into Yom Kippur, uh, where I believe a special grace is available upon the church that we're going to see a, a massive revival of people and a massive revival of the things that are necessary in the church a revival of humility and surrender, a revival of fasting and prayer, a revival of uh, this surrender and holiness, a revival of consecration, a revival of commitment to the cause, a revival of love, and a revival of unity, brotherhood, and co-laboring. These are things that I see that are of absolute necessity that have to come from revival. And of course, of, of, of the, the ending of all those things happening within the people of God, a revival of a love for the lost and a reaching out to bring the greatest harvest we've ever seen. And so as we consider these things and we're looking for these things to happen and for Israel um, sacrificing the red heifer, let me tell you a few other things that maybe you haven't realized that have just recently happened. Uh, there was a UN sanction uh, against Israel re requiring a ceasefire in their um, ongoing efforts to eliminate Hamas from Gaza. Now, I'll tell you, it, that is going to be an extremely difficult thing. Even if they do eliminate everyone that's part of Hamas, uh, polls have shown that 70% of the people in Gaza believe that what Hamas did on October 7th was justifiable. Not only that... Um, but um, they desire that after this is all over, uh, the majority of those that live in Gaza uh, would like for Hamas to continue to rule in the politics. So it just goes to show that this is a pervading thought and mentality among all of the people that live in Gaza. This is the Palestinian people. This is how they think. And so it's to destroy Hamas would really almost mean to destroy all of the Palestinian people. Probably why we see calls for people saying that this is a genocide, uh, because they know that to eliminate Hamas means to eliminate Palestine, um, which is now Israel's goal. But that would actually be the only way to eliminate that mentality. Um, so um, I think I even shared before uh, that uh, I saw these interviews among young people, young children, eight, nine, twelve. Uh, asking them uh, what they want to do and what their desire. Uh, every one of them was, I want to stab a Jew. 
I want to wear a bomb and blow up Jews. I mean, so these, this is what's being ingrained in the kids from the time that they're uh, young in, in Gaza. This is how the Palestinian uh, mentality is among the entire race. So we need to see that. But anyway, when in this UN resolution, uh, for the one of the first times, the U.S. chose to abstain. In other words, they did not veto. We are one of the nations that has veto power in the UN, and we chose not to veto. That is huge. It caused Benjamin Netanyahu to cancel a visit to the United States to speak with Joe Biden, hapless, illegitimate President Joe Biden. And um, uh, that's very uh, key. I mean, it just goes to show that the tensions are growing. And I'll tell you this, that every time that we have stood against Israel, we have seen something catastrophic happen here in the United States, which is one of the things that Kim and I have had very strongly uh, in the past several years. Uh, we've spoken of dreams and visions that we've had about the United States and things that, that we sense are coming this year. We have felt very strongly that there is something that is coming uh, to the United States. We don't know exactly what it is, but it's coming and it's going. I believe that we're going to see something happening this year in our country uh, that is part of this whole uh, continually growing beginning of sorrows um, that is continuing in frequency uh, and greater intensity, increasing in frequency and growing in greater intensity each time. So I expect that we're going to see something here in the United States this year, uh, really expecting, I uh, had expected that something would have happened a long time ago regarding our economy. We know that it is falsely being propped up through the continual printing of money that keeps things afloat. And I don't want to get into all that right now, but what we need to see also is something significant that happened just the other day, which was the destruction of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Uh, that bridge was named after Francis Scott Key, who is uh, the author of the Star Spangled Banner. Oh, say, can you see? We know it very well. Uh, and we only sing the first verse of the four verses. I believe it's four verses. Um, and But to me, it is key. It is uh, showing, uh, the, it speaks something spiritually that that happened. I don't know if it was purposeful or not. Uh, that's not important. What I see is the destruction of it speaks to uh, the destruct, continued degradation of America, the falling apart of America, the no longer upholding what we sing as our national anthem. Um, and that the beliefs of this nation, the holding of truths from the Constitution and the Bill of Rights are crumbling, just as that bridge crumbled a few days ago. All happening when? When we chose to not veto the UN resolution and protect Israel and support Israel. Uh, and so we see also from October 7th this great anti-Semitism uh, building again. The majority of Americans now believe that what Israel is doing in Gaza to eliminate Hamas has gone too far and needs to stop. That's something we would have never seen before in American thought and um, sentiment. And so we need to see that, that this movement uh, in the spirit against Israel, we know that from their inception they've been persecuted. We know that Christians from their inception have been persecuted. With those things being the case, uh, increased anti-Semitism across the globe is going to bring about increased uh, anti-Christian sentiment. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, <clears throat> and so as I've been saying anyway, that I believe persecution is coming because Jesus said that we would be hated of all nations for his namesake. There's no way that we can avoid it. I see that those that support Israel will begin to be ostracized and persecuted by those that are supporting Palestinians, as we're seeing a greater amount, especially here in the United States, of sentiment towards Palestine, which really is what? Support of Palestine is anti-Semitism. Uh, they may not always see it in their roots of what they're speaking and what they believe, but that is what it is. And so uh, that is one of the things stemming from all this that is occurring. What is going to happen if Israel sacrifices the red heifer? I can tell you this, it will bring a solidifying of those of the Muslim Brotherhood, those that are of radical Islam, all of those things that we spoke of earlier being uh, Hamas, Hezbollah, um, ISIS, Boko Haram, whoever it is that are these groups, um, Al-Qaeda, uh, we need to see that they will band together. They are those that believe that Israel's purpose is to destroy Al-Aqsa Mosque, take over the um, 
Temple Mount, rebuild their third temple so that they can begin to sacrifice again and follow the Judaic law. Um, this is going to be a banding of them against Israel. It's a huge thing. Could it be the hook in the jaw that speak that is spoken of in uh, scriptural prophecy of God bringing all nations against Israel? And we've already seen our sentiment change as well as European sentiment changing. Obviously, uh, Arabic nations already have a sentiment against them. Will it prompt a World War III? Will it bring us to a place of all nations like Iran, Syria, Jordan, etc., uh, Yemen, uh, joining with radical Islam to uh, attack Israel? Um, how about um, because these heifers were found in Texas and brought, will there not be blame from radical Islam against America for uh, helping Israel in um, being able to do a red heifer sacrifice? Will we see terrorist attacks in the United States? There have been so many people led in this country that we've not vetted, that we don't know who they are, that uh, definitely I would say some have ties to radical Islam, uh, are probably creating cells within the United States as we speak and are already planning attacks and preparing for when they can do their next 9-11. We have to be aware of these things. What does it mean for us? What do we do? Uh, to close this out, um, Kim and I have uh, called for a fast and prayer time from October 8th to, uh, I'm sorry, October, uh, April 8th to April the 29th. We're doing this because, um, as I mentioned before, Passover is from sundown on April 22nd to sundown on April 29th. I felt, Kim felt she, to call the fast. As soon as she said it, I just felt an agreement in my spirit. And um, so um, I felt to have it end at the end of Passover at sundown on the 29th. Going back 21 days takes us to April the 8th. Uh, oddly enough, it is the day of the uh, solar eclipse. Uh, it'll, it'll have already passed over by then. But um, this solar, uh, that so April 8th at sundown through April the 29th at the close of Passover at sundown. Uh, we're calling a fast to fast and pray. We are feeling um, to at least fast uh, liquid during the day and possibly having just one meal at night. Uh, could be something light, non-meat, um, veg vegetarian, uh, soup, whatever. It might be liquid, whatever you feel. And I'm just saying that because um, you need to pray and hear from God. If you're feeling the Holy Spirit uh, coming upon you, even as you're hearing me speak this, um, pray and ask what it is that he wants you to fast. This is the time for us to fill our lamps with oil. Um, those, I believe, who have been filling their lamps with oil are being attuned to these things that are happening in the natural that are really affecting the spirit realm and will be... Um, significant in drawing us uh, headlong into uh, the acceleration of what is happening in this hour, possibly bringing us even into the tribulation period. Um, sorry, I'm not a person who believes in a pre-trib rapture. And so I believe the church is going to go through many of the things that we see in the book of Revelation prior to God pouring out his wrath upon the earth. And so we um, must be filling our lamps with oil uh, there are many things that are going to be coming upon the face of the earth that are going to cause a great falling away. Um, and so we need to be aware of that, that we are at this hour being part of that Jesus revolution that is occurring on the earth. We are those that are filling our lamps with oil. We are those who are returning to our first love, who are returning to the first works, the early works, who are after souls, who are uh, letting go all these extremisms and, and beliefs in the body of Christ and just allowing God to have his way in our life. Uh, and so it, there's nothing like fasting and prayer that brings us closer, causes us to be more spiritually aware, and uh, definitely f uh, helps us to rid things in our life that are no longer necessary, that we no longer need to have, and um, uh, just build us up spiritually. I encourage you, do not just fast, fast and pray fast and pray and get in the word of God, fast and pray, believe God to speak to you in this time in dreams and visions and with angel encounters with angels. It's time for us to begin to be the spiritual people that we read about in the book of Acts. It's time for the church to return to the image of the early church 
uh, in a much greater fashion because there are so many more Christians than there were at that time all across the globe. It is time for a global revival and a global manifestation of the church who are citizens of heaven manifesting the kingdom and displaying the glory river of God and the life of God and the light of God and the love of God, all of these things that reside within us, uh, the truth and the holiness of God. And that's all that I have to say right now. So I trust that this is ministered to you and I trust that you are seeing the significance of what is taking place in the natural that is going to affect the spiritual. And so I just pray that God will just touch you in this. Father, I just pray right now for all those that are listening. God, that you'd bless them. Father, in their time that they've spent listening to me, God, that their hearts would be pricked, that they would hear what I'm saying, Lord God, that you're saying through me, that they sense the urgency of the hour, that they make the decisions and the vows in their spirit, God, before you, that we would all, Lord, surrender to you, God, that we would humble ourselves before you, God, that we would consecrate our lives to you again. Lord, that we would return to our the early works, Lord, that we would return to our first love, God, that we would ask, God, that you would cleanse our eyes with eye salve, God, that we might see, Lord God, that you would purify us with holy garments, wash us in the blood of Jesus, Lord, that we would, um, Father, be stoked with that burning revival of prayer and fasting and holiness, that we might see your glory, God, and walk uh, in the in this last, uh, this end time, great army that you're raising up, God, being powerful people. And uh, I just want to say as I close one other thing that uh, important, I think, is that for us that see, we have to understand that we have a responsibility as those that are leaders that are already walking in the glory river of God, that we see that there's got to be someone who goes from ankle deep to knee deep, from knee deep to thigh deep, from thigh deep to waters to swim in, that leads the way, that are forerunners, that become harbingers, declaring what it is that God is doing in the earth today and to follow us, encouraging them to follow us. That's us. We are prophetic forerunners. We are prophetic reformers, calling for the change that is necessary in the church, for people to come out and be resurrected and awake and come into that which God is doing. We, uh, we have a responsibility upon us in this time of fasting that we pray for the church. That is part of our responsibility. Besides just filling up our lamps, we need to be praying for the church, for revival, for God to raise up apostles and prophets in this hour that are uh, true apostles and prophets, that are realizing the necessity to work together. Prophets and apostles who are working regionally to uh, create a great net of unifying the church uh, to uh, impact communities. Uh, for revival centers uh, to um, to arise, uh, apostolic revival centers to arise in regions, and uh, just for God to be able to do what he wants to do, just global revival. And uh, I say all that uh, to close. Thank you for watching. God bless you guys. I love you, and I'll be back again soon. Amen.